Hi guys, this is Aubrey Dawson here at the Campbell County Environmental Education Center. Now this is only my second time doing a video like this, so bear with me, I hope it's enjoyable. Uh, I'm going to be doing a few more for you guys that you guys uh, can watch and learn about different animals, birds, um, we'll even go outside and walk around out there, but today I want to to talk to you about um, nocturnal animals. Now normally I would do a night hike uh, out here at the education center for you guys, but unfortunately we can't do that this year. So I wanted to make it so you guys could do this at home. Some of the stuff you can do at home um, is fairly easy. Let me get back down here. Uh, one of the things I like to do on the hike is at the very end is get Lifesaver Wintergreen Mints. There we go. There we go. Uh, Lifesaver Wintergreen Mints, and they have to have the sugar in them. And one of the things you can do is um, pick a partner. You want to make sure it's dark outside, your eyes have adjusted, or you can do this in a dark room. You need to make, like I said, make sure you give yourself time for your eyes to adjust um, to the darkness. And then you just simply, with your partner, take turns, put these back where your uh, wisdom teeth are or your, um, uh, your big molars in the back. I guess a lot of you don't have wisdom teeth yet. Uh, and then just look at each other. And the first person goes and you want to bite down with your teeth but keep your mouth uh, open at the same time, and you should see a reaction, a spark um, happen. And that is basically the sugar molecules. When you bite down, they release, and then they collide, and they create a spark. And that's kind of imitating a lightning bug or a firefly, whichever you call them, uh, outside. They have tribal luminescence. They naturally glow out there, and it's a way for them to communicate to each other. A lot of insects chirp or like crickets rub their legs together, birds sing, uh, animals make noises and they can communicate. Lightning bugs, they um, blink their, um, uh, they blink like sequences to each other to communicate, which is pretty cool. So if you do this at home and you notice like, oh, it's super hot, that's basically um, just the mint uh, mints you know, can seem like it's hot, but if it's uncomfortable, just, you know, spit it out on the ground or in the sink, or not the sink, trash can, preferably. I bet your parents don't want you spitting this in the sink. Um, another fun experiment you can do is just get regular balloons. And what's cool is nocturnal animals, they don't really need to see in color. They just need to see the shape, the shadow, the movement of their prey. And we as humans have, uh, most of us, I should say, have developed rod and cone cells that the cone cells help us see color. And the one way to remember that is they both start with the letter C. Cone cells help us see color. The rods help us see the shape and the movement of different objects. And one of the ways to um, show how this works is you basically just get a balloon and you blow it up. Sorry, if I seem distracted, I see people um, outside. And, sorry, <laughs> I'm closed. <laughs> uh, and, okay, where did I leave off? So you blow up these balloons and you kind of stand maybe five feet apart from each other, you know, or social distancing right now, six feet apart. And you blow up this balloon, you want to make sure it's good to dark, your eyes have adjusted, you've been outside for a while, and we're not talking like you're outside and your back porch light is on, or you're walking with uh, regular flashlights. You want to use um, red flashlights when you're hiking outside in the dark. I don't know how many of you are actually hiking outside in the dark, but uh, red, using red helps your eyes adjust a lot quicker that way compared to like a white light. Think about it when you're sleeping and, um, you know, maybe your mom or dad or grandma, my mom used to do this to me, to wake me up and flick the lights on real fast. 
it's kind of shocking, you're blinded for a minute. So yeah, if you use a red light, that won't be an issue. So back to this, what you do is you blow it up, the person, the other person or people are standing six feet from you, and you try to have them guess um, the color of the balloon, which is pretty, uh, you'll get all sorts of guesses, and then when you do use your white light, you, after it's blown up, you shine the light in there and people can see the actual color of the balloon. The one thing I've noticed when I do my hikes is the white balloon, um, because I'm out in the woods surrounded by a bunch of green leaves, is a lot of people always guess green for the white balloon. So if you're doing this with somebody that hasn't seen this video, don't tell them that, and just see if they guess green um, for a white balloon. It's pretty interesting. So those are a couple of things you can do out on the trail to kind of simulate um, how nocturnal animals um, function in the wild. But I wanted to go over a couple of, or more than a couple, uh, nocturnal animals with you since we aren't actually out there. Um, let's go ahead and switch this, flip this around. And we got Mr. Beaver. So let me move a couple of these other ones. And if you're seeing other animals in the background, um, I will uh, be going over those, I think, in uh, future videos. But beaver, you can, some you see them during the daytime, um, but they're mainly nocturnal or dusk animals. They can get up to 60 pounds full grown. So beavers can be huge. Most of the time we only see them from here up. Um, beaver have really interesting uh, fur. This outer layer is covered in oils. You know, we put on like deodorant um, to help us with our sweat. These guys take their body oils and put it all over themselves. And if you've ever helped in the kitchen, helped your mom or dad in the kitchen baking, you know oil and water do not mix. So it kind of is almost like a waterproofing for them, or rod, water resistant coating for them. They're not waterproof. And then the under part of their fur is thick and warm, and that's what helps them get through the winter along with all their fat. Um, people have harvested beaver throughout the years to use um, for blankets and coats and that kind of stuff. They have these big, wide tails. Um, these tails help them not only swim, um, think about using flippers in the, if you've been to the ocean this summer or, uh, or even in the pool, um, they help you swim. They also can use these as a warning system. So if me or another predator is around, they will slap that on the water real hard to make a, a lot of noise to scare it away. Uh, they have webbed back feet and their front feet look like little fingers almost. That helps them chew wood. They are second to humans in the way they can manipulate and change the environment. Um, so if you look, you can see teeth marks on here. And they like to go, you know when you break a stick and you see that green layer underneath the bark? That's the cambium layer. That's full of nutrients and good stuff that they're after. They don't actually eat the wood necessarily. They do, um, you'll see trees, that, uh, stumps that look like, uh, like if you sharpened a pencil. And uh, that is them cutting down a tree to build a dam or a lodge. And they also have to chew on, uh, on sticks uh, to keep their teeth short so they can actually eat. Um, real food because their teeth keep growing just like our fingernails we file them their teeth they have to file as well so that's our beaver let's go on let's go over here to the case real quick quick and i'll come back to these guys but i wanted to show you this is our bard owl 
Um, these are the most common owls you're going to see here. You're going to see here in our area. Uh, one thing I like to do is I like to take an old like boom box and I have a CD with owl calls and I will call in owls that way. But, you know, it's 2020, we can use the technology we have. Um, and a lot of us have Bluetooth speakers. Um, just download owl calls on your phone and you can go out and try to call in an owl. But um, you have to watch when you actually, you know, call them um, and how much you call them because they can become aggressive. It's, you know, them thinking another owl is in their territory situation. So that is the barred owl. That's the most common one. Um, he says, who, who, who cooks for you? We have the great, let me open this case this way. So this is the great horned owl. These guys are the most aggressive owls. Um, they are as common, but if you see a great horned owl in the area, you more than likely won't see some of these other owls because they do, um, they will attack other owls in their territory. So they're pretty aggressive out. They, will they attack you? Probably not. Um, unless you're, it's hurt and you're sitting there messing with it. Um, so that is a great horned owl. And here are our screech owls. So they come in a couple different color morphs. This is the um, cinnamon or red morph. And then we have um, the, like the gray brown morph. So these guys almost sound like horses when they whinny. Uh, that's, they're little, but they're mighty. These guys are my favorite uh, little ones. So a lot of times when you're calling in owls, um, you can use just a normal flashlight and when they come in, kind of scan. They don't land all the way in the very tippy top of a tree. They're kind of mid-level. So scan your flashlight around and you'll see their eyes glows. Oops, sorry, uh, glow and that's when you should be able to notice them um, a little bit better. So that's our uh, screech owl. Another, let's see, we got two more since I'm already in this a case over here. Um, this is a bobcat. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of people being Kentucky, I always hear wildcat. Wildcat is just a overall term for wild cats. You can call a stray cat a wildcat, a mountain lion a wildcat. Um, but this is a bobcat. And if you go up north uh, to like our neighbor Canada, over even to Alaska, you'll experience the lynx. They're much bigger, bigger wild uh, cat than the bobcat. These guys maybe get 30 pounds full grown. They're pretty elusive. They need a lot of uh, area to, to live. And unfortunately, the more housing developments that go up, we used to have them here at the park. Um, houses popped up and these guys have left um, around here. That's not to say they're not around here, but um, I know people, um, this is going to sound crazy, but Fort Thomas. Um, if you're in Fort Thomas, you might hear these guys. You have just the right um, type of woods for them. They, um, if you're like, what does a bobcat sound like? So if you're ever saying maybe you're walking around the town at night, you're a night walker, um, or sitting out on your bike, back porch and it sounds like almost a lady screaming in distress. It's probably um, a bobcat. They have the very high pitched, um, it's almost nerve, um, nerving to hear what they sound like. And if you ever see one, you probably won't see it for long. It'll probably run and hide uh, to go somewhere away from, away from you. Um, we have the raccoon over here. So these guys um, are pretty common everywhere. They, the front uh, hands look like human hands. 
which gives them the ability to get into our trash. If you leave food in the car, your parents' car, and they don't lock it and there's raccoons around, they can and will get into your car and eat more than just the sandwich. Um, they will destroy an inside of the car. I'm not saying I've experienced that. I'm not saying I haven't experienced that, but make sure your car is clean <laughs> or locked. Uh, let's see. This other side because there is this is let's see here this is an American woodcock so these guys like big open areas they um, it's pretty fun to watch them let me set my camera up here and see if I can imitate them for you guys but they have these big long beaks and they love to hunt for worms under the ground. And you'll see them, you might be able to have your parents help you um, look on YouTube, have your parents help you um, to find the American Woodcock dance. And what they do is like they kind of, they get their feet real wide and you see them like bounce up and down and they move. They bounce up and down, then move some more, bounce up and down. And what they're doing is they're feeling for the vibration of the worms underneath their feet. And when they feel one, it's pretty, they'll stick their big long beak, which I'll show you. See how long that is? Here's my finger in comparison. They stick that down in the ground and they get their worm. Uh, let's see, let's go for a little walk over here, since we're on the move. This is our friend, the coyote. Let me flip the camera here. So, the front, should have moved this fence out here. There we go. So that's the coyote. These um, these guys are pretty common. Um, they, uh, this, this one looks small, but that's pretty average size. They can get bigger than that. Uh, we also, what happens is they can um, mate with a domestic dog, and that makes a koi dog, and they can get larger. And so uh, these guys, unfortunately, if there's stray cats around or if you leave uh, like food outside for a cat um, or something else, these guys will take advantage of whatever animal is coming to feed there. So just be cautious of that. Will a coyote attack you? I always get asked that. And I wanna say, which I should have researched this, I wanna say I just heard of another of a story about a coyote attacking but the only actual uh, recorded story of a coyote or a coyote pack attacking somebody is way up north i think it might have been canada and i think they were a hybrid coyote um group pack and there was a girl running and the girl the girl's fine now but uh yeah the they weren't just like the coyotes we have here so that's not uh, common. They're going to run from you. They know we are the top predator and they will um, try to escape. So let's see what else we have. Ooh. We got our deer. So this is a buck. This is a male deer. We know this because he has antlers, not horns, antlers. Um, they use these to fight other males for territory. Um, they will scrape trees. Um, to mark territory as well. And also in the summertime right now, they have velvet on there. And that is a living tissue um, on antlers that they will rub off um, here probably maybe another month, maybe sooner, just depends. We got a fawn right here. And then I don't have mounted here. Um, a doe, which is a female deer. She doesn't have antlers. Um, some, sometimes when a deer is young, 
you can mix up if they're male or female because you can't see. A lot of young males will have, we call them button bucks. They're like little knobs uh, on the top of their head. Those are the horns that are starting to grow. Um, so, yep, we have a buck, a doe, and fawns are the babies. Let's see, what else do we have in here? Oh, I'll go over to what I have on the table so we can talk about that. This guy right here. Let's see if I can figure this out again. So, let me just bring him over here. move the camera and then you gotta get it all level again. So a skunk, this is, we have the striped skunk here in Kentucky. Normally they have a stripe running down their back. You can see this one has two little ones coming out. Um, they, they can have a lot of white to a little white. It just depends on, on the skunk. They have these claws that are great for um, digging. They love to dig gardens. If you have a garden at home and notice it's always tore up, it's normally from the skunk. They love to dig for grubs and insects. Um, now skunks are basically blind, but they hear really well. So a lot of times if you get sprayed or your dog gets sprayed, it's because um, you're screaming or the dog is barking. What they do is they'll do a handstand, they shake their rump at you, and that's your warning saying, hey, leave me alone. Imagine if you couldn't see and everybody started yelling around you. You would be afraid, you would want to get away from the situation or defend yourself in that situation. And that's what the skunk is doing. Dogs don't know they should be quiet, unfortunately, and so dogs get sprayed a lot. Uh, this guy is just trying not to get eaten. That's what he thinks is going to happen. So they shake their rump, and if you're still making noise, that's when they spray you with that stinky smell, and you got to get an oatmeal or tomato bath um, over and over again until that smell dissipates. Um, that is our stripes. We have I've got a couple more animals here. The opossum, they are the only marsupial here in North America. And another marsupial would be maybe like a kangaroo in the outback. That means they have a pouch um, on their bellies that they keep their babies in. A possum can have um, normally like 12 uh, babies at a time, but they can have up to 20 and they're all the size of a teeny tiny dime. It's like smaller than this mint right here. And so they live in their mama's pouch for a couple of weeks until they grow. And then whichever ones survive, if you ever see it, it's pretty interesting. They all hang on their mama's back and she carries around and shows them where to eat, um, get water, shelter, all of that. Um, we, know that they have these curled tails to hang from uh, trees, but they just don't hang from their tail. This is a lot of body weight to put on one little body part. So their back feet, um, this guy's missing a toe, but they got their back feet here that can, uh, see that's, they curl backwards and that grips onto the tree as well. These guys, I love to call nature's tick controllers. They love to eat uh, ticks that are tick eggs, larvae. Uh, they also, uh, all, all these animals are a good reason why we shouldn't litter. If you throw your leftover french fries or burger or whatever out the car window, um, thinking, oh, it's no big deal, it's food, it'll decompose. That's where these guys come along and um, they're taking advantage of whatever food they can find. And they're not very fast, so they might get hit on the road a lot. The car coming and instead of running away, possums 
lay dead. Um, they think, you know, if I'm, I'm dead, there's something, or if I just die, there's something wrong with me. You don't want to eat me. I probably have a disease. So that'll leave, you know, whatever predator to leave me alone. And basically what happens is, you know, don't want to hit my mic. We have a normal heartbeat. I don't know. I'm not a nurse. That seems, seems normal. And then... You know, when these guys want to play dead, their heartbeat slows way down. So they don't die. They kind of go almost into a coma, comatose state, and eventually they'll come out of it and go, go on about their night if, you know, that coyote or doesn't eat them or if the car misses them type of deal. We got one more animal over here, which is, we have the red fox here, and over here, there's a gray fox, which in another video, I will go over um, to the gray fox and show you that better, but um, you really see, I really, I was thinking, debating if I wanted to save this guy for another video, because you do see them during the day. Um, but foxes are interesting creatures. They have these uh, big ears. Better to hear you with, my darling. Does anybody know what um, tail that's from? Okay. So they have these big ears. They can hear a little mouse or mole underneath, um, you know, a few feet of snow if they had to. Not that we get a few feet of snow here in, in northern Kentucky. We just normally get ice. Um, but Arctic, you know, fox, they can hear um, their, their rodents several feet. And what they do is they jump up, and they dive down, and they get that as a meal. They have um, whiskers. Let's see. They have these whiskers here that helps them if they need to get into holes. Um, that helps them feel just like your cat has whiskers. They got this big fluffy tail. They can use that for balance. Um, they can wrap it around themselves to keep them warm. And they will even twitch it certain ways to communicate uh, with other fox. So, like I said, there is more to talk about with the fox, but that's going to, um, I'll have that for another video because um, I'll want to talk about the gray fox as well. So I think I'm almost probably about a half hour. I can talk a lot. So this is just on nocturnal animals. Uh, all these animals, you know, they're not going to hurt you. You don't have to be afraid of them. Um, like I said, they're going to run away from us. So you're pretty, pretty safe for the most part. Uh, most of the time in an animal attacks or you hear about an animal attacking, it's either very sick or it was provoked. So just let the animals be, watch them from a distance, and, and enjoy, enjoy their beauty. Uh, go out, try to call some owls, see what owls you have in, uh, around your home. And you'd be surprised, even if you have just a little patch of woods, you might have an owl living in that, in that patch of woods. So once um, I am starting to have classes again and I will be doing night hikes, um, I am limited only up to nine people. I make 10 at this, at this point in time. That could change here soon. Um, but I would love for you guys to come out and experience this in person. And I hope you all have an amazing um, week, school year. We're getting, because I'm not sure what order these are gonna go up. But um, just know that you guys are meant to succeed, and I'm sure you'll do amazing this year. So I um, will say goodbye, and you all enjoy nature as much as I do.